sorry, I forgot to go back and do it. Welcome. How about that movie? Huh? So, guests, come on out and let me uh, get, a, get a seat, get a water, and uh, I'll introduce everybody. Come on in. Here they come. Zach, we're going to put you in here. Come on, man. That's uh, that's stunt water. Don't lie to me. That water bottle. That water bottle. Yeah. Where, where's Frankie? Frankie, you, you mixed that right there. Verify that. That was a water bottle. It sounds like exactly. All right. Well, let me just tell you who all is up here. It's an impressive group. Um, oh, it is a very impressive group. Right. Those were the guys. Does this count as a group? No. Uh, yeah, I think we have a forum. Wait, is that our? Is that our? That's our. Right. Are we yeah. out? Say hello to the interwebs, everybody. They yeah. can see you, and they can see us. It's 360. Say hello to the bureau group out there. a cliche, but it's true. He is an art center alumnus, and the word visionary is bandied about a lot, but in this case, we're going with it, because he is a visionary filmmaker. And the writer <laughs> and the producer. <laughs> and general mensch, and I can be in the We have a mutual friend who is a studio head and once said, I'm not supposed to a studio head. Yeah. We're still <laughs> it. So anyway, and thank you, Zach. This is all him. Uh, so thanks for this. As you can see, you probably realize after sitting in those chairs why we need this renovated. Um, yeah. Everybody, you get a holy Next on our list. Um, Dylan Clark, right here, uh, is the, Dylan was the universal exec at the time, he greenlit this bad boy, which, yeah, which is impressive given the fact that this was the first time direct, film director, uh, feature director, and uh, Dylan is founder and CEO of Dylan Clark Productions, and um, he has done a number of movies that I really like, uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Oblivion, War for the Planet of the Apes, and um, we're going to ask him, I could go on and on, but not. we're going to ask him a little bit about the whole green light process. So, next, going this way, we have Frankie Matano, who is the supervising sound mixer, and... to experience that tonight, that's for sure, but he has also done movies, little movies, like uh, The Revenant, Watchmen, which you'll hear and see tomorrow, The Fugitive, Birdman, and many, many others. This guy has been nominated for nine Oscars. <laughs> there you go. And it's, you know, it... over oh, nine. There you go. Tends the charm, man. Uh, it's it's really gauche to like brag on your own kids, but his daughter is one of our film students who we think is awesome, and she's here tonight. So if you hear anybody heckling, then chances are it'll be her. Yeah, exactly. There we go. And then Jake Weber, who you might all recognize from this very movie. Uh, He works a lot because he's so good. He works in film, theater, television. He was in Meet Joe Black, written by one of our instructors, U571. Uh, he worked on one of our alums, uh, Tarzan Singh's The Cell. He worked on Born of the Fourth of July. We've also seen him on TV a lot, American Gothic, Medium, Homeland, many, many more. And here's Michael from Dawn of the Dead. And I just want to mention, 
at around 9.30, he's got a book. So when he gets up and drops the mic, it's not because he doesn't love us. It's uh, He has a prior engagement. So we're going to ask him some questions first. So welcome, everybody. <laughs> so I'm going to do a uh, lightning round of questions for everybody. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead, because you're actually way more interesting than me. Uh, lightning round, and then we're going to open it up to you guys. <laughs> now go. Oh yeah, sorry. Yes. Use your inside voice. Yeah. yeah, it's better not to yell. <clears throat> okay, first of all, before we get started, <laughs> I'm actually not being loud. This is not. This is a microphone. I, I can't wait for you to speak into one and say how loud it's awesome. Um I just wanted to say, first of all, thanks to um, Vero for uh, hosting this amazing event for being. Taking us out to the World Wide Web's with this, um, you know, incredible. I have no idea uh, technologically how this is done, but look at that. That that looks like you know in Star Wars, like one of the remotes that they might. Yeah, that's cool. That's that's anyway. So amazing. Shout out also to all the like you know amazing fans that are out there watching and the amazing fans that came all the way from all the far reaches of the earth to come to this event. I think you guys are beyond amazing and crazy. And I can't thank you guys enough. It's just too much. It's super humbling and it's too, you guys are too cool. Too cool. Um, so thank you. So that's uh, a big thank you to everyone and, and whoever's watching. Hopefully you're enjoying this. I have no idea. But, okay. So yeah. Oh, all right. So now we can answer some questions from the interweb. Please do. So we're all here to watch a director's cut. So I'm going to ask you the same question all three nights because I think it's really relevant, is in terms of what you wanted to accomplish with this versus what was released. Tell us a little bit about what you might for. Well, I guess, okay, so I have always been, I guess, you know, sort of being a, um, when I was in film school and, and you know, in the early 90s, in like late 80s, you know, I uh, they were like the sort of idea of a director's cut on sort of VHS or <laughs> or or it, it literally ended up. I remember I bought a uh, laser disc player. Yeah, sweet. The Criterion laser discs were like that was it. This is the coolest, possibly highest quality thing that exists. <laughs> That's what I thought. But there was like, you know, that idea of like, oh, the director's cut is going to come out on, you know, this laser disc, and that's cool. And I thought, so I had it in my mind as a possibility. But when we were working, and of course, look, from a marketing standpoint, it's kind of cool because the, and we'll let Dylan speak to this, because he, he was his, he, they, they, they have a whole plan. They know, they know that I'm going to like, what they do is they, they, they they give me like, okay, do whatever you want. And then you do it and then they go, oh, that's cool, we're going to cut that out. <laughs> and, then, and then they said, they said well, you can put it on DVD and we'll call it another thing. And then we can sell two DVDs instead of one. Which is cool for me because I think I'm getting one over on them and they get one over on me so it works out. I'm pretty sure nobody ever said, do what you want. No, no, that's true. No one ever said that. They, it was sort of implied in your eyes. Uh, <laughs> maybe in my eyes. <laughs> there was some nodding, possible nodding, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No means yes, Mr. Director. No. I do remember, though, that um, when we were shooting the movie, Matt Lee and Eddie, remember Matt was the DP, and Matt said to me, like, we were about three quarters of the way through the movie. And he took me aside and said, you know what, Zach, I'm going to be honest, you're being way too nice to the studio. I was like, what? Like, I thought they were the guys you're supposed to be nice to because they could fire you. Because what the problem is, well, right now, you've shot enough of the movie that they don't know what the you, you did, so they could not possibly put it together without you. So you can, you kind of can... That Leonetti did not work ever again. Yeah, well, I know. He was like, trust me, kid. You can do whatever you want. It's fine. Like, um, you, can, it's my you can go over schedule. It doesn't matter now. They can't stop you. And I was like, what? That's a thing? 
<laughs> yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a thing. He goes to spend my entire time eight hundred movies. <laughs> this is the point where the director can do whatever he wants. So of course I didn't do whatever I wanted. I started to feel a little more confident. I would say based on that, because before that he just made me fear constantly. So it was a different. No, he didn't. Other guys did. Other people ill attacked. <laughs> and to say it right in front of you, let's, in the, let's, go, let's go to Jake before he leaves. Because yeah, that's right, Jake. This yeah. is a real talent. All right, yeah, so Jake. <laughs> Actually, uh, <laughs> Jake, I am going to ask you a question because you, um, you had these little snippets <laughs> of stuff to work with. When we meet Michael, there's no exposition. You're just standing there, you know, shooting at Ving Rhames. And, uh, and then you, you have these little brush strokes of character. And by the end of the movie, you've kind of fleshed him out, and he's like this everyman hero, and we love him and everything. So you're coming to this in the script, and you're working with Zach. How did you get there? Because it was great. Yeah, this is fun. That's nice of you. Oh, I can see. But there certainly was no any kind of grand plan. Just <laughs> it, was, it was scripted, and we just did the moments. But it's nice that he was just he's just a regular guy. He's just not a tough guy. He's a regular guy. It's a lot different than your average action movie where the you know, the hero is he was in special forces and he knows how to do this stuff. And your character slowly stepped up to the plate. And that's how it was written, like, you know. Gave yeah. by Zach and they cast a pretty recessive guy. <laughs> <laughs> um it's some jeans like that. Yeah. And uh There you go. And he's modest, too. Well, what can I tell you? All right, so Dylan. Well, I, let me just pump him up a little bit. We, we did want to cast. We talked a lot about this with Zach, of course, and Eric Newman, and Mark Abraham, the producers. And we, Zach wanted to find real people. And Sarah Polly, I think, grounded the movie right out of the gate because we could have gone a different direction in studios in the early 2000s. Was, we were definitely pushing limits on credibility, meaning we would cast these Amazon people to play nurses and things like that. Um, and we found Sarah Polly, who's a quality actor, and then we had to find the kind of matching counterpart, and Jake had been doing really interesting work. Um, HBO show, I remember, was really good, and um, lo and behold, Zach said, this is the guy, and we all were like, yeah, let's do that. And I remember my boss was going, He's not an action star. You said this was going to be an action movie. Yeah, we said a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> that line is, TV says a lot of stuff that isn't true. I always thought that was very poignant to this movie. When I first read for the part, uh, Ty Burrell and I were in the same room, waiting room, waiting to go in. In New York, right? In New York. Yeah, yeah. That was the first time I met you. And then um, you guys switched us up. He sat down right? in the way, right? waiting room, and then I, I read, because he was supposed to read for Michael, and I was reading for his part. And then they, you guys switched us up, and then, I don't know when he was cast. I, think I, was, cast, I was cast, like, towards the end after you threw a few options. I, I, I don't remember that part. <laughs> yes, you do. I do remember. Because the whole time you were, you, were, you were pulling for me, is what I heard from, from Middleton. I just was like, no, that's the guy. They, they might have said, they, were, they might have had other ideas, but I was like, no, that's, that's it, that's, that's going to be fine. He was funny, he was like, I didn't, you know, I'd never cast a movie before, I just was like, oh, this is fun, like, these actors come in and they just, like, say the words, and some of them, like, are the guy that you think is in the movie. <laughs> and, then, and then you say, yeah, I want that guy to, to do it. Like, it's more complicated than that. Now the executive finds out. So Frankie, I got to quote you. <laughs> Actually, about, works. About the sound better lately. Um, so th th there's there's like famous story about how the sound guys for Psycho bought every melon in the grocery store so they could stab it and find out which one sounded the most like somebody gently getting stabbed. So everybody likes to know the magic of what you guys do. Tell us uh, a little bit about some of the sound stuff you use and then how you built this whole sound. Universe in this movie, so yeah, that's our that's our our, our code. You and I have a thing. Mm -hmm. As you heard tonight, 
Um, yeah, my ears hurt. <laughs> Tomorrow you want to see that. Um, you know, there's there's several ways that the sound effects go. Minus uh, we get from production, we get the actors' dialogue, whether it's boom or live. Um, that comes with its own set of challenges. The ambience of the location, noise floor is equal to the volume of the dialogue itself. So we have to kind of comb through that material, try to keep as much as possible. Uh, we go through an EGI process. Let's bring the actors in to reread the lines if A, it's story clarified, or we have technical issues. And uh, from that, everything is built either from field recordings and or library, but Universal, Scott Becker, and he's in, he's oversees the collection of the sounds, bringing bringing the sounds to the stage for new recording mixers like myself. Um, this one was a little bit different than most because he he actually had to bring in ADR talent actors to come in and do the vocal performances. So they're not uh, they're actually human to start and then offset with very you know very speed and or animals, so on and so forth. So this movie is a little more complex. That's how I was starting to say. So Don't not do that. <laughs> so, so that was the, the complex part of the collection of sounds. Um, we do what's called the tempo, which we want to put a quick soundtrack together, uh, borrowing music from other films, picking up dialogue quickly, adding some of the movement sounds to the movie and get it in front of a, an audience, uh, the demographic in which the speaker is marketed. Uh, so this is five-year-old or something like that. Uh, and we get back numbers, the likes, dislikes, so on and so forth, picture changes, these little nuances, things happen. Um, he knows more about this movie than <laughs> I don't know why. This is amazing. Keep going. Uh, don't stop. <laughs> yeah. I'm learning too. But, uh, so uh, that's the reason why I'm saying this is the first time I get to see the film. So we're, we're, we're going through the film, real one, and the clock goes to a slow-mo, flips the time, and it's, it's, it's a suspension of time, but sonically, it's really big because it's a close-up. So that was one of those, right away, it wasn't just this obvious movie. It was Zach's obvious movie. And the cinematic, through the movie is what makes it special sonically. You get to match the picture and then manipulate the audience. Really brought it home with that. <laughs> All right, that's great, guys. Thanks for coming out. I just have to follow. I do remember there's a couple, I do remember that, like, also, there's this, the studio was like, you know, could there be more scares in the movie? It's all sort of scary. I know, but at the time I didn't know that. So they were like, could there be more scares? And so I said, yeah, you know, we can, is there any way like we can make, there's a cut where Big Rain's like, they're sitting at the fountain and he, and he, and he, and he loads the, and he loads the gun and they're like, hey, what if that was a, super loud and they're kind of like, so if you notice, I, I feel like, There are a there are a few more kind of loud moments in the movie that would kind of try to that I was trying to satisfy this. Like, there was a like, lot of you could see the studio in this movie. You saw a first time director with the, just the studio freaking out, <laughs> and, and that jump sound scare was. Yeah. I, I, I did get, I did get a note like we want more jumps in the movie, and I was like jump. What does that even mean? I don't know what jumps. Scare you artificially. Yeah, that would have been better. I think. <laughs> By the way, I could have like I would have respected that. That wasn't my note, but I had to bring it up. Jumps. So jumps. So so sound. Where do you sound as jumps? Yeah. I like that. We're stealing it. Which leads me to a question for Dylan. So it's two thousand whatever. This movie is an active development. What was it about Zach and his take and him in the room that? Made you guys green light a first time feature director. It was, I, as I remember, it was 
our getting once we got to Zach, it was easy. There was you know we went through a bunch of other directors I think that had made movies not well, and we're like that that guy has at least made a movie, but they were like yeah, but those were bad movies. No, because movies he's made, movies he's made three of them, three bad movies. He knows what he's doing. Oh, but, it's just, he's consistent, he knows what he's doing. Wasn't it the guy... Oh, we're not going to name names. Okay, sorry. <laughs> God, he's just terrible. But there was someone that was... Yeah, everybody can look it up on the interweb. Oh, it's on the interweb? Uh, there was someone that was supposed to do the movie. Oh, oh, you know, it's good. He had to do another movie. No, the good story was, the script... Uh, there, back in this day, uh, Any Cool News was uh, very... It was a huge important web. Very huge deal. And Harry Knowles and his partner, sometimes Roger Avery, who was also a writer, yep. wrote a Quentin Tarantino movie. Yep. And I think he went to Art Center College and, 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 thought, and so. And he he wanted to he, he they got the script and they picked, they had heard that we were doing running zombies, which they lit into us. And then the internet went, These assholes slept with my left side. Um, sorry, internet. Um, it's yeah, not the they, internet's hurt. Work. Zombies don't watch. <laughs> you make a promise, all this. And, but Roger came in and had a meeting with Eric Newman, who's the, the producer and one of my childhood friends. Um, and he said, I read the script, it's great. And then posted the whole meeting yeah, with Newman uh, on the internet. And then we hated it. Then we, we boycotted it. And we this and stuff. Getting to Zach. Um, he had just this incredible enthusiasm. Um, he wasn't the most articulate person I had met. In fact, I don't think he finished a sentence back in those days. But he would he would, wasn't necessary. He would start the sentence and and do pretty well for half of it, and then he would get up in the room and then he act it out. And he would do all of this stuff. And my boss at the time, Stacy Snyder, would just be like, What is he? Oh, this is and he's kind of cute, and Stacy liked cute directors, and he was like, that's me. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Was he wearing the was he in the sweats? In the sweat t shirt? He was always in t shirts. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I owned anything other than he he did he look he spoke um he did speak about the genre part of it and he spoke about wanting to do these cinematic things. I mean, he was not able to articulate that opening sequence is just amazing when she finally leaves the cul de sac and you're following her car, you're up above and you see the helicopter from the original Dawn of the Dead, which is you know cool. I heard a couple of you people go, Whoop, the helicopter. Um, and then that, that explosion, and I think, um, based on the early conversations we had had in the you know the vetting of Zach, he was able to articulate that cinema but without that specificity. And I think once we saw that, um, we knew who you know again he, that visionary word is used because of who he was in those early. Days. That's nice. That's really nice. Nice. You were objectified by I do I do remember being, case, thought was, I do remember being objectified. No, I don't remember that at all. It was fine. I, I, but I do remember like literally I think just saying the word running zombies and then like we I, I did jump up in the room and say like they're just gonna they're gonna slam against the thing and then was like, Okay, that sounds cool. Or, uh, that seems intense, yes. Yeah. Uh, you had pitched the tunnel sequence too, which I don't think was in the script we had. So James Gunn wrote the original script, which is amazing. I, in fact, read it last night because I'm that nerdy. That's cool. And, um, and it's good. There's some crazy sequences in it, but there isn't the tunnel sequence. And I think you actually pitched that in the Get the Job meeting. That you wanted to you know, find another sequence. Great sequence. That's cool. Oh, show of hands. How many persons? Oh, you mean going over to Andy's? Going Coming over. back. Yeah, and this, and this Yes, yeah, dragging him and he's shooting the guy. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, you tried to articulate. Again, you. Ryan. Yeah. Who prefers running zombies? I do. There we go. Listen, we, I am. You catch that internet? I'm not like I'm a, I'm a middle of the road guy. Like I, we did that running zombie thing because we needed that for the film. But I'm also not against. I'm a sh I'm a Shambler fan as well. If there's Shamblers in your film, I'm 100 percent down. But if you know, if you need to ratchet it up, you, by all means, make them run. Make them run. It's cool to add something to canon like that. I think, like running zombies, is a thing that we've added to canon that that has become like it's its own thing, which is cool. I mean, I think that you know that's the one thing about the zombie genre. I didn't know when we made the movie that the internet existed and that there were people that were super into zombies, like in a crazy way. Like I remember. 
I was getting some death threats about like, if I didn't fuck this up, I'm gonna kill you. And I was like, what? <laughs> what happened? Like, it sounds like you're getting comic books, but I wasn't really into zombies. That, I mean, I liked the movies. They were cool, but it, it wasn't my lifestyle choice, you know. And though I respect that as one, it, so yeah, that was a thing I discovered. Are there zombie connoisseurs here? Yeah. Gotta be. I mean, just because they're here. It's, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. They might not raise their hands, but they're here. It's a nine. It's almost ten o'clock at night, and they're right. watching people talk about stuff. Uh, so I got it's an issue they have to deal with. It is. So, so we got some questions from the Vero user base, and I'm just going to ask one because we really want to open up to you guys, and definitely ask Jake one before he has the book. Uh, so uh, Lenny Fiali, but good question um, that kind of is appropriate for this school. What advice would you give young filmmakers? You said Jake answers that. that. No, <laughs> Jake, do you want it? Like, what what oh, advice would you give young filmmakers? I really do want to know. What advice would you give young filmmakers? Bring ideas. Ah. <laughs> Bring ideas is really actually, the, that's kind of the whole thing in a lot of ways. No, seriously, it, it really is. Because did we, we just gave an example of that in our, you might not be able to speak, but if you have, if you have ideas. So, so, you can act them out. Yeah, exactly. It is a visual medium. It is. It's not. I mean, there are, there's good talking sometimes. But, um, I guess, so what the question is, young filmmakers, what, what do you the advice? advice. Get I, was, I, I think for me, young, what I say to students or anyone who comes up to me and says, I want to be like a movie director, what do I do? How do I do it? I always say, like, just, if you have an idea, try and film it as best you can. Try and, like, get your friends. <laughs> Get your, it is. You're the only guy up here that can fix that. <laughs> Could you edit that out? It's like if you were in like a helicopter, you're the helicopter pilot, it's crashing, and you're like, it's not like, I don't know what's happening. You went right there. The helicopter is <laughs> It's literally like for those rocks. Um, but, but no, like, I really do believe that the, the, the in, in our modern world, like everyone has, a, you have a movie camera in your pocket, you literally are carrying it around with you, 4K camera in your pocket, and you get, like, you know, like, I often hear people say, like, ah, you know, like, the camera, I can make a movie, they're filming me while they're saying it, too, like, if I just knew where work. these cameras were, what do you say, and I'm like, well, you have, like, a giant, you have, like, five years ago, you literally have a camera that's like no one could buy, so so try and use it anyway. So my point is only that if you have a vision and if you have like an idea and if you have a a way of seeing, try and try and express that through the little piece of equipment you have. Whether it's that camera, whether you go buy a more expensive camera, that's fine too. But just try and try and make it. I think that's it. I will do. Well said. And be tenacious. So let's let's have some questions from the audience, please. We have one right up front here, and here comes a mic. Uh, hi, Zach. So uh, there's a really, really gorgeous shot at the end of the film. It's kind of over here because it's on Michael, and it's sort of like the camera is on him. He's framed by red on one side and blue on the other side. And I don't know if you have anything that you remember about designing that specific shot, but um, if you don't remember anything specific, about that, if you could just share about your approach to color design, because I feel like your color work is gorgeous, like your color palettes are always exquisite, and I think it's like, I mean, you have many strengths as a director, but I think that's definitely something that I always notice across your body of work. Okay, uh, I guess that shot in particular, um, also there's like white behind him, there's some smoke in the middle of the frame, it's kind of separating. Um, and I think that like, I remember when we were talking about just when we were talking about setting the shot up and, and, and we were working on it as, as an idea, it's a pretty emotionally rough moment, I think, for everyone too, like, because, you know, it has, I always say that this movie has like a rock and roll ending. To me, it's like a rock and roll ending for this guy that like, kills himself and it's a hard cut to black and, and rock and roll music, you know, comes on. So 
it's a very like it's like a pet cemetery ending. You know, like if you've seen that movie, Pet Cemetery. You know? The hard cut to like, ah, oh, I don't want to be buried. So you're like, oh, fuck. that's crazy. So I kind of felt like that, and I and I picked that song. People who had died. I was driving in the car. I had like a tape, a, a mixtape. That was a while ago. Um, I'll take it was on t- CD. It might have been on CD. Let's say it was on CD. That's fine. anyway. Um, but I do remember like sort of trying to visualize that whole little sequence, you know. And even the Sarah shot with the sun kind of behind her because, and, and look, it's problematic in your mind when you're visualizing that sequence. Because he says, I think in the script it said, I want to stay here. I think in the movie it was supposed to be just a crack of dawn in the script, right? Because that was, and he says, I'm going to watch the sunrise, enjoy the sunrise. Um, and Truth is that you know when you're shooting a sequence like that, the sun just comes up and you can't fucking stop it. <laughs> and like by the time you have this idea that like the sun's just gonna be barely up and it's gonna be this awesome like you know, and then it's like noon and you're like this is ridiculous. Um, but I think we did get that shot pretty early, which I thought was a triumph in itself because I was when I was watching the movie tonight, I was like, okay. When he actually says the line, the sun's kind of low in his eyes, and I felt like, okay, I believe that. I believe the sun's I believe the sun's low. So that's cool. And so, but that was all in the same kind of setup, right? Because we we had it was like one of our few crane days because it wasn't a very we didn't have a huge budget, so we didn't have to crane all the time, which is which is cool. So it's good, it's good that you don't have to crane every day, all day. We do that now, but it's, because it's, it's makes you lazy a little bit. But um, so with the boat, I guess we had the crane on a barge that was like right sort of to the side and behind. So that's like you notice when they came running up, there's like a oh they all fall on the ground when the explosion goes off. There's like a down shot and it moves down along the sail, and you see them all climb on. So that's all the same setup, right? And it was a I think it was a type of crane. I don't know if they had those. Maybe it was. Because I do remember like all that coverage. Yeah, it was. Because all of that coverage on the um, Jake when he's like walking to get the, uh, to untie the boat and then coming back, that's all off the same side. And so we were able to kind of do all of his side pretty fast. And it wasn't like, we didn't have to do a big switches to, because um, he could push the boat away and there was just him. And, if I recall, I think it was over two days. We did it on the second day, and the first thing up is the final shot. Or did we do it on the, on the same day? But I do remember I, that. I remember we were moving fast. Yeah, we were moving super yeah. fast because, like, I didn't want it. To, I didn't want to get into the afternoon. We had the big explosion to do, and we had all that fighting. So I think now that I think about it, actually, we did all that coverage out on the out on the dock first, and then we went in. Did and did all the fighting with Michael and, the, and all the and the explosion because I I remember saying like, we really have to get this in the lowest light possible the other stuff we kind of cheat you know but I think that that shot to make a long story short uh, that shot because it was on the on the crane we pushed the boat away you know we were able to like really make a nice shot and a nice moment there and I think when we got it into when I got in with uh, in the telecine. We were kind of running the shot. Now, also, I think the one thing to know about this movie is I think it was like the second or third movie that they had done a DI with at Universal. It was just like they cut the negative anyway. That's how they didn't even know. So when I was actually, when we were restoring this to the director's cut, one of the things that was crazy was I was like, okay, so now we can do the director's cut. They were like, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead, knock yourself out. <laughs> Whatever, no one's going to buy that. Um, no, we didn't, we didn't, that wasn't, they weren't there. But it was still. Um, so I went to look at restoring. The, the, the reason I noticed it was because, you know, the in the shoot, Mackay shootout sequence, we're shooting with, uh, what's her name? The old lady. Um, they had cut the negative so the frame, when you cut the negative, you, the frame dies, you know? 
they literally destroy a frame. So I couldn't put it back exactly because there were just frames missing all over the place. And I was like, well, why did they cut the negative? It doesn't make any sense. Like, we did the digital finish. But they were just like, no, we have to archive it, so you have to cut the negative because that's how you make a movie. So, it was a, so my point is that when we were in there working with this DI process, and the cool thing was because I had come from commercials, and those were all the tools that I knew. The DI really worked well for me because I didn't know how to color time a movie like a, like a professional filmmaker. <laughs> I knew how to do a DI, though, better than, better than most probably of the people that were working because I did it every day. That was the way I worked. And so that shot in particular, I remember being able to like swing a bunch of power windows and be like, oh, look. I can, I, I know how to like, you know, so power windows are basically like you, you bring these like filters in on the side or like vignettes and things like that. And you can actually physically like, say, okay, this side of the frame, I'm going to darken, this side I'm going to light, this is, this center of the frame will have more contrast. And I think at the time you could only do, I think you could only do four windows. Now I think it's a limitless number or something crazy. Who did that? Stefan? No, Steph did the, you guys wouldn't let me use Steph for that movie because he was just a commercial. No, he was just a commercial. He hadn't done any movies yet. They are just a few. It was someone at eFilm, I forget. Um, we could look it up. He was a cool guy. But Matt was very, like, allowing me to, like, it's, do whatever. So those shots, and it's one of the best really carefully made. Movie. And I like also that sh the, those two shots the shot of Sarah with a little flare and the shot of Jake, those are two great. Really, when I was watching them tonight, I was like, really good. Yeah, really emotional. Was, I don't know if that answers the question 100%. But <laughs> it was the best of my recollection. It was Dawn. Yeah. Michael was dead. You see what they did there? Okay, just making sure. Uh, quick question for Mr. Weber before he, he votes. Anybody? Okay, over here. Thanks. Hi, um, I love you as an actor. I always have been. I love you. And meet, no problem. I meet Joe Black and in house. And I always feel so safe and calm whenever I see you on the screen. And in this movie, absolutely. And it was, it was a little. I didn't think of it as purely an action movie. I thought it had a lot of, a lot of heart. So did you take it uh, when you got the script? Did you approach it any differently? Did you just take it just as as real as possible, I just think. Very serious, very self-serious back then. <laughs> Younger and, and well, I always, I thought it was totally in genocide. I just treated it not as a genre movie, but as real, as a possibility. Having some of the fun on set, because I was, you know, weird headspace Watching the movie now, I see it was so much fun. fun to watch. It was enjoyable a couple of hours. But when I was working on it, I would try to see it. it paid off because it was, I thought it was perfect. It's nicely, it was beautifully conceived, you know, the part and how slow, his slow development, the angst is cutting in. He becomes something else that he didn't know. He's sort of not a rasa, he doesn't really have any identity, he has all these weird jobs and energy. Doesn't have any real identity, and then he sort of finds his identity in this apocalyptic you know, moment of societal crisis. crisis. And you know, that's, that's kind of cool. And then it's so, so sad. When, sorry to tackle on another question, but you were going to, the man who got bit on the hand, were you in, in the character's mind, were you just, was that an ultimate decision you were going to kill him right then and there? I think it was, it was, yeah, he was the kind of guy. I think it was scripted. Yeah. That moment he takes that moment, there's no question. Yeah. Get him off. So. But it's funny, when, I remember when we were shooting um, the end of that, and you had me pull a trigger once. Yeah. Yeah, because you want to have that. That was a nice little DVD. Pull a trigger. And also, I remember the first thing we all did uh, when we sat down and met with Zach. I remember, we were all up there in Toronto. The first thing you did. Right at June Carroll's. We all, all our friends died right after that. That was the first moment. We played some of the music. We played the stereophonic song, Have a Nice Day. So the music, which I thought was so 
I've always thought the music was so great in this. Um, the choices were so great. And that Jim Carroll. The punk By the way, I, I used to just drive around my car and listen to that. Like, I'd put all those songs together and I'd just listen to them. Be awesome. <laughs> if we could get it to a mix, was that mistake? Yeah, for sure it was a take. It wasn't. A so, and now I remember my car didn't have it. Sure. I'd like to just add a CD. I'm adding before Jake leaves. I, that scene is very powerful when he walks in and and Sarah looks up at him and says, "I'm glad I wasn't here." Um, and your reaction to it, it's great. It just it sells everything without a word. It's, yeah. it's also a sweet moment. The uh, chainsaw moment. Yeah. <laughs> It's really as I'm trying. Yeah, and he's like, all I got and she says, that's like, the most romantic thing I've ever seen. That's yeah. pretty cool. I don't think that was in the original draft script. I don't know. Anyway, that, no, that was, you wrote that uh, on the weekend. I think so. um, I might have. Yeah. Then it came up some good. So. And one thing before I go, so I got to get my kids two hours late for birthday. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I noticed it the first time. I haven't seen this since the. Here in 2004, um, but I felt that what Zach did was really cool. Is he never made a maudlin, but he still allowed for us emotional. Just the tone and the pacing. You're awesome. 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 I know, you're the best. Thanks, man. Thank you. We should talk about sound some more. I wish we get some more sound. Yeah, sound. Yeah, sound. Yeah, I know what happened next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question about sound some more. What about, wait, I so the last time, when last we read, we had just like previewed the movie. I thought that's where we were. <laughs> that's where we were. <laughs> that's where we, were. <laughs> we hadn't thrown one football into the basketball movie. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, since you know sound is kind of very important for movies, when, especially you're watching them, um, how do you know when to stop? I mean, other than like studio deadlines for when you need to put out a movie, how do you stop yourself from trying to get it perfect? Uh, the motto is there's 24 hours in the day. So we just don't go home. That's basically it. <laughs> Fourth of July, we uh, poke our head out the studio, see you know, theme park blowing up some fireworks. Get back. Good. So, I've never so, heard so, that question. Yeah, this really, so uh, I think the second half of that is uh, we never finish; we just run out of time. So the, but the last little thing we can do is we get a chance for one for Blu-ray DP, get those finite notes. Uh, working with Zach and Debbie. Zach's like, that was cool. <laughs> I go, love note. Because most of the time they're critical notes. <laughs> um, so, so we have a pleasure in saying this. Get all those love notes. And, and Zach's kind of general. Like, what to do. So we, we assemble the movie, a, a real by real. So we're about 20 minute chunks. So we focus. It takes about two and a half days. Or so for each twenty minutes. Well, it's multi-layered, um, and the thing about sound is it's transparent. So, but it's also a powerful tool, especially in this movie. It's really dynamic, where we build sound pressure. It's big. It's up there. It's up there. It's up there. And sound, sound music is so you're constantly tweaking. There's a lot of picture editing or mixing, overacting those changes, reacting notes. Our sensibility, so we're always trying to get every last best. Oh, I'll hand up over here. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Keith from the Nice Cast. I quickly also want to just thank Barrow for bringing me out here. Uh, so shout out to them. Uh, also, uh, it's. Uh, it's a good feeling to be in a place where we can appreciate Zack Snyder films and not get essay-sized comments on the internet why we shouldn't be fans of yours. Bye. I've been robbing this uh, <laughs> podcast or whatever this is. <laughs> um, one thing that's always fascinated me about your career, Zach, is sort of the creative evolution. 
uh, like for my social media audience, I always say stay low and build. And that's been your career when I think about you starting from commercials for various brands and then the Michael Jordan's Playground and then your directorial debut. So I was wondering if you could share the, the insight into the process and the journey. Did you internally always know that movies on this scale was the thing for you or was it something where one thing led to another and you just went with your gut? Yeah, it's, good. it's a good question. I, I, I had always wanted to make movies. That was why I came out here. You know, like I, was, I love movies. I grew up loving movies. I made movies when I was in high school or with my friends. And I made, like, you know, it's all, like, I kind of, that's, like, my thing. It was like I, I made movies. Um, and so when I got here to the school, I, I, I made a movie. I was just saying this upstairs. I made a movie in, like, my third term. Um, here at school, and I just kind of realized that, like, like looked at it, and I was like, "Oh, it's gonna give me a job off this thing." <laughs> and, yeah, like, who's gonna see the Steven Spielberg and be like, "Yeah, this kid, give this kid, you know, a movie." I'm like, that's not gonna happen. So I sort of, I'm like I said, panicked. <laughs> but I was like, "Okay, so I gotta, I gotta buckle down and figure this out." So I just started shooting some spots here at school. And the thing that you realize when you do like a spec TV commercial, like out of, as a student, is that you can you can get the production value in sixty seconds. So say you're making a thirty minute short film or even a twenty minute short film, all the money that you're going to spend on the film is like stretched out over twenty minutes. So it is what it is. But when you're doing just thirty or sixty seconds, you can brush all that into like you know a pretty finite size and you can create a product that would feel the best student film is hard to pass off as like a big budget Hollywood epic. You know, it's difficult to do. Some people can do it. But a 60 second commercial, you can get pretty close to what is on the air, you know, and I think that I was able to, like, my reel was able to create um, a bunch of spots that felt real TV commercials. They were weird. They felt like TV commercials. And so that was how, when I got out of school, I had this pretty pretty cool reel. And actually, I did Michael Jordan's Playground while I was on, like, I graduated. I was out of school for, like, six months. And then I did Michael Jordan's Playground, and then I went back to, and got my, I was working on my master's, and I did a three three or four more spots, and then I got, when, I never finished, because I actually finished those spots, and then I got a job, then I got a job, like I got signed to a company, so I was just like, you know, I had to go to work. <laughs> so my point is only that, always in distance was this idea of like, oh yeah, I want to make movies, and I had run up, you know, I was going to make the SWAT movie, that was, oh, that was the movie I was, that, that was the first movie that I had gotten all the way down the road on, and I was pretty much ready to film it, and um, you know David Ayer had written the script, and you know it was pretty much we were going to make a super hard R rated movie. I was like, I want to make a movie where like any SWAT cop after this movie, you know, everyone's just going to think they're fucking awesome. <laughs> like it's going to be like they'll be able to, you know, they're just going to be like. Stone cold studs, no matter where they go. He said, like, I'm in SWAT. They'd be like, fuck, I saw your movie. It was awesome. <laughs> so that was the movie I wanted. It was like basically propaganda. <laughs> SWAT Aganda. Just made that up. Um, but so, but then the studio. That was so was so They said, they, they said, they, they said, what about, let me, let me just, let us, we know you're. Excited. We like that. But what if it was PG-13? You think that's a thing that's possible? I'm like the guys have the they're the cops that come with the guns out already. Right? <laughs> you know, like a guy can go through his entire police career and say, like, I've never drawn my pistol my entire career. You know, I'm proud of that. Like these guys, the guns are like out. Like that's it. They're like they want to shoot someone. So I was like, I just don't see it. Like I don't know how. I don't know how to do it. So anyway, then the relationship went south based on my 
non enthusiasm for our for it's, not it's important to just this is important. He he basically talked himself out of his first picture. Yeah, I quit. I quit the movie. That's I quit. Funny. And by the way, I was told by my manager and by the head of that studio that I wasn't that you well, weren't supposed to do that. Not cool. <laughs> Not cool that we were gonna give you a giant, pretty big movie. Bigger than Dawn of the Dead, much bigger, twice as big, at least, as far as the budget goes. And I was like, no, no, I can't do it like that. And so, but thank God that the Dawn of the Dead script literally arrived, or, or Eric had it, like, two weeks later, he's like, hey, what about zombies? I was like, zombies are awesome. <laughs> and then I, then, you know, so it, it, it worked out, it worked out cool, but... You know, you get all the way. You you pretty much do anything. You know, it is it is a it is a thing. Like you sit in that room with these like super smart people, and 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 they tell you like, oh yeah, we want you to make your movie, and you know it's gonna be awesome. And then they go like, so that's great. This is your dream, right? That's awesome. That's great that that's your dream. Um, one other thing. I know we didn't mention this right away. Is PG thirteen? That's cool, right? Like that's a big deal. That's like does it change it at all? And so like you you know it's a pretty it's pretty crazy to think about. Like I was like listen because to me I was like I was making TV commercials. So as far as compromising goes, the cool thing about a TV commercial is you're kind of out of the eight when you make like a if you're making a Valtrex commercial. You know, you know, and like, you're not, it's not going to be, you know, it's herpes medication, you know, <laughs> there's not like, a, you're not like, the bar is kind of low for your artistic expectations of like, you know, the, the compromise part is a, like, that's out the door when the board arrives, like, it comes to, you know, your house, and they're like, okay, so what do you think? You want to jump on the phone to talk about this Valtrex commercial? I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, so, you know, it's another thing entirely when you're in, and, and you've been like, you're thinking about like, oh man, there's going to be like SWAT guys, and they're like going, they're trying to protect this big guy, even though this is the guy they hate, they got to protect him, because these guys want to kill him, they got to move him through the city, and there's all these gangs trying to kill him, it's going to be awesome. And they're like, yeah, but we're glad you're into it, <laughs> but is it cool if, like, you know, we just fucked the whole thing up? <laughs> so, you know, so I think that that's the that's the scary, like, you know, like, look, because in the end, it's it is a product. You know, you do have to people do have to go see it. And you and you have to like kind of go like, okay, well, what is the thing that would these people are investing a lot of money? In, what is the thing that would make it the most successful? And it's a difficult, there is a difficult give and take for that because you don't, no one knows. You know, there's a, it's a magical, impossible thing. Didn't answer the question again. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you can get it down. It's a gift. That's a long It landed. Next question. Who's got a mic? Right here. All right, yeah, so, hi. Um, so, a quick question for you. Uh, without giving away any. Spoilers, are you taking any learnings from this film and applying it to your next zombie film? Oh, this Dawn of the Dead? Yeah. Yeah, well, look, recently I'm yeah. super excited. Look, I will say this. This movie, when, I, when we finished it, I was super happy with the tone of the movie. Right? I was super... It, it, it was a very difficult tone to, to hit. Which is this weird, it's like self reflexive, it's aware that it's a zombie movie, but at the same time, it doesn't let you off the hook completely, but it also is not afraid to like show some serious gore, but it's also not afraid to like have fun with that same gore because it knows that it like you're within genre, like when you blow in his head off, it's like ridiculous, but it's also awesome. <laughs> so like it, it's that it's that 
there, there's a super cool tone that kind of, it's like this tennis, you're playing this sort of game of tennis with the like emotional like, tone of the film. Where, where is it exactly? And I think that's a thing that is really inspiring and cool and a thing that I think I can do even like more crazily and now that I kind of understand the why of it. You know, at the time, I, I knew I liked a genre, knew I liked zombie movies, and I knew I liked certain aspects of them because I knew that it was absurdist. And I, but I also knew that I believed in that absurdity. I know that sounds crazy. And so it was, it was, a, it was fun to me. Like when he gets his head blown off, that is fun to me. So it is a very particular thing. So it's like, you know, a doctor, you know, like doctors don't get squeamish when they see your, your hacked open. They just you know, oh, look, that's cool, your lungs. And, like, <laughs> and so like, I think that, that that's like, to me, that's like, when you take it apart, like that's, there is something fun, inherently fun to me in the, when you hit the genre tone and it like, and it's like a, it's like a bell, you know, just kind of, you're like, okay, that's right. And it's impossible to know. The cool thing is that there's no way to know what that is until you actually do it. But I, I do think that will end up in the other, that sort of style, not Andy getting his head blown off, but that idea of like how much fun that can be will definitely, now, especially now that I'm trying to have some distance from it, I can, I think I can, I can do it with with much more deliberate and sort of um, pre premeditated uh, design than I did here. I knew what I wanted, but I just it was all fresh. I'm just like, wow, okay. Cool. I was like, can we make a head that we can just blow up? Like, is that anybody? And the guy would be like, I guess we can. I was like, okay, so we should just get the actor. Cast his head and then like blow it up. And that'd be cool. Then, okay. Actually, it's cool because if you look carefully, one of the eyes like flies at the lens. That's really great. Yeah, you get, I think if you flee it, it's like there's an eye. We have the editorial. Like, That's awesome. Let's look at it again. <laughs> How about the uh, the uh, pause on the surface? Oh yeah, that's good. Oh look, I like you said. Yeah. Learn, you know, yeah. I mean. Yeah, it's cool. You didn't. Um, what? This is a. This is a funny. This is a funny. It's, it's, this is also just. In, it, it, it doesn't. It's insightful of nothing, but it's fun. Um, so when I showed the movie to the studio, this was not even the first time. I think it was like the studio being over here. No, it's, I, the studio is also over here. You just reminded me. <laughs> but this is the. This is the friendly studio. Sorry, my chair just broke. I'm gonna leave it because it's. Anyway, what's that? Yeah, well. So anyway, I was showing the movie, and the uh, and you know the scene where they all like all the zombies are at the bottom of the stairs and they're trapped, and they, you know, where the zombies are running really fast, and all of a sudden they slow down. That's it. And then they start thinking like, oh, we're going to slow down," and exactly that's that yeah, part that's it right there. But we showed it, and he did not. This was not his comment. Someone said, uh, "Okay, Zach, I have a question." I'm a little bit. Do you think the zombies would really stop at the bottom of the stairs like that and just look? And I was like, you know what? In real life, they would. It's a hundred percent. You, you got, you got, you do, you. I fucked up. Yeah. But I was like, also, do remember this is a traumatization. So like. We tend to like embellish. So it is fake. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank him. Anyway, that's all. That was good. It was a good. That's it. I think we talked about it on, on stage. We did. I think we talked about it all the time. We did. In every movie, I think we talked about it. Remember that time? Yeah, that was good. We're doing like every movie since then. We go like, remember that time the guy said that thing about the zombies? In real life, they would. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> This explains Dylan's success as a studio executive and a producer because you can keep a completely straight face during that entire exchange. I, I love it. I was not a successful studio executive. This was a this was one of my better ones. Awesome. I thought that is not. Yes. Hi Zach. Um, what is your 
process and approach to editing. Okay, so what you do is you take, what you want is, there's slates at the beginning of every shot. You gotta cut those off. That's what you start. <laughs> that, was, that looks crazy. No. I've had a, like, I've had a lot of, I've worked with a lot of great editors, and I have, it's funny because in this movie, this movie has a particular cut in it that I love, which is when, um, and, and if you actually look at the cut, it's, 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 it makes no sense, but it actually goes right by, which is the moment when uh, uh, Sarah, Sarah Pauly's husband leaps on the hood of the car and he punches the glass, right? But the, the moment of impact is he punches and it's actually, a, it's another shot when, it, when the window cracks. There's a cut at the crack. And it's obvious, it's not like, it's not, you weren't trying to make it look like the same moment or anything, but it's kind of cool because it's, 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 it's a pretty jarring shot, but it's, it's it's one of those shots that's, that makes you go like oh wow editing is cool because like on paper this should look this should be horrible this moment should not work at all but like, in the movie it, it it makes me I always go like oh that's cool because it, of how cleanly it, it works and how it should not work and I think that that you know like so the relationship I've had with with all these amazing editors I've worked with I always you always learn something. New from everyone. They've cut like a million movies, you know. And I have a re I have a pretty strong idea about the way I want things to go together because I draw all these shots, and I I always draw them in the order that I think that they should be cut. And so it's a very it, it's not that they. And the, the cool thing about David Brenner is David would always sit with my storyboards, and like, the assembly would always be based directly. We fucked around with it, but you know, it always the base was always that. So. I think my relationship to editing was really strong because I always had a very clear idea about like how I want shots to go together. But I do also think, on the other hand, what you learn from someone who you trust and who you respect aesthetically as far as their how they think the shots can go together, or how they can like sort of like change the order and say, okay, well look, if I move the shot down and we eliminate this section of the movie, it's still it's clean, but it kind of like maybe it's maybe it's more direct and. Or, or you might find yourself have totally restructured the entire film. And these are things that happen every day in, in the editorial, but like I think for me, it's a constant evolution. But the, the thing about a great editor is them trying to just get your perspective and like understand how you want, how you see it. And like I said, I think having this document, always having this document of the way uh, of the shots drawn, the scenes drawn. It has been has been helpful in my my relationship. Hey Zach, um, this is a question mostly on most of your films, especially Dawn Man, Steel PBS, and Watchmen. When you're um, you know making the movie and stuff, when like for the intros and the endings, are you deciding on how like what song you use? And I know for BBS and Watchmen, Man of Steel, you use the themes or you know, what's in there. Um, and then for you know Dawn and Watchmen, you use uh, you know, the man, oh, the James. Times are changing. Yeah, times are changing, and the Johnny Cash, and and then yeah, my chemical romance song. I just want to know like when you're writing it or whatever, whatever you're doing, are you picking those yourself or are you you know as you go? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in this film for sure, I was like it was on my mixtape again. Um, <laughs> when the man comes around, it was on my mixtape, so. I've been listening to that uh, song. I think that Johnny Cash hurt. Was it hurt? What's the name of that yeah, album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that album had just come out, and I was like, "Yeah, this is fucking awesome." I'm gonna get the man. And the man comes around, should be in this movie, and then it just it's it works amazingly well. That sequence, and then um, "Times Are Changing" is a song that is very indicative of Watchmen. It's like in the it's in it's referenced in the graphic novel. So for me, that was just like a really easy. And then on that, on that movie, we were able to get the stems. Then we got the we got the stems from um, Bob Dylan to that song. And we were able to remix it because we made it like a minute longer or something crazy than the natural, the, the normal version. We, we remixed it, and so we got our hands on those original tracks, which were horrible. I think right? when they were all like bleeding. Always, that's always a struggle. To get that much control from the artist, especially iconic songs like that. 
be able to change balance relationships and focus. So do you always have to be careful? Hey, we wanted to sound like Tom, but we're not. Well, nice the there. last thing we wanted to be is the guy that's talking about Tom's air changes. <laughs> you did, though, so. A little bit. No, no. Uh, last thing, though, I, before I give it back, I was kind of proud of him. Oh, awesome. He's the best. Hopefully she's there. I think she's probably, she's her there. Oh, is she texting? She's going to be yeah. texting. <laughs> That's a good question. Can you kind of talk about uh, like choosing a uh, director of photography, like a uh, first AD, like what what do you look for in your crew members? Um, I think I've done, correct me if I'm wrong, but Matt was, uh, I mean, for sure, I I wanted, I had this idea that I was going to get, I think my first idea was to have Larry Fong shoot this movie, but I only Larry had shot a movie. It wasn't good to do first time director and first time. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> I mean, if I was still that, that well, it just it was hard to say. You're, you're one Except of, I wouldn't have had to like you fuck him over now. <laughs> <laughs> you're taking a shot, or an artistic shot on some, you know, somebody, and you're hedging the bet a little bit with, with your boss mentality. And what you okay. want to do is protect the vision that you're 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 employing. So you want to give this guy his tools. But you also want him to look at all these other tools that have done it before. Well, ah, no, no, that was good. I mean, that's good. That was good. That was, that's, that was good. And I, I think other than he tried to do some subterfuge. No, it was just cool. It was cool. I, it might have been just a move to get me more on his side. I, you don't know. In the end, it's hard to say. But um, it worked regardless. Um, but the funny thing is, when I did, when we when we shot Don, I had, um, I was a director cameraman. In commercials, I was a DP and a director. So like, I was like, I should just shoot the movie myself. Like I don't, like I don't know. They're like, you need to hire a DP, and I was like, what? Why? I'll just do it. And they were like, uh, no, that's not a thing. And I was like, what about my friend Larry? He could shoot it. And they were like, okay. So it does make sense when you hear him say, like, you hear me. Like if I was saying that you, my friend Larry, who went to art school with me, with me, he was great. Right. <laughs> He's totally cool, which turned out to be true. Great, he is great. See, so maybe I don't know. Maybe, yes. but in hindsight, it should have been in hindsight, it, that is true. Um, <laughs> but in hindsight, I mean, Matt was a great choice, and he was like I learned a lot from him, and I and I really I had a great time working with him. He was amazing, you know. He knew what he was doing, and it was it was fun. And he also let me operate tons of those shots. Like he would just say, "Okay, Snyder, take the camera, go film the shot." And I'd be like, oh. "You know, so like he knew he knew I was chomping at the bit half the time, or like all the close-ups, you know, all those crazy giant close-ups of like keys and, and everything." If you if you notice, the movie has this cadence of like a giant close-up, giant close-up. There's all these giant close-ups. So like you know, to me it was like very much a claustrophobic. It was supposed to be a claustrophobic movie, and I was probably these big giant close-ups, and all especially on doors. I had this obsession with the this idea that like these doors, this was the thing that was holding them in. So like doorknobs, locks, keys, everything regarding doors had these giant, these giant close ups. Um, so we got these like InnoVision lenses, which are these sort of close focus lenses. And they're, 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 there's this super long, you need tons of light to shoot with them. And so they're like, I think they open to like an eight. You have to have it like an eight, at least at like maybe. The, the widest they opened to it at that time was amazing. And so we would have these shots of keys and stuff. And so Matt would just go, Zach, go. We, we'd have a setup to do, you know, like we'd be doing something. And he'd go, like, oh, this is going to take half an hour. Why don't you go shoot your keys? <laughs> and they'd go shoot your key shot. And they'd go, oh, cool. And I'd run off. And I, it just kept me busy, you know, like, because otherwise I had too much, you know, it was 20 minutes for me. That's like, you know, a hamster's life. That's like that's like an hour. I'd sit down and go like twenty minutes. What the fuck am I gonna do for twenty minutes? Yeah, like we're, we not, then no one could play. It was Canada. No, they could play football. They invented football. Don't forget that. Everyone remember that football was invented in Canada. I've been told that a lot. I shot all my moves in Canada. Trust me, I know. You know that. But so he would give me those little assignments, and so it was like really it, it kept me sane through the like because I just so. You know, 
I wasn't used to not shooting, um, like directing and, and not shooting. So it it's you, you as a director, you find yourself. You've told all the actors what's happening. You've told the camera where it's going to be, and everyone starts to make the shot. And then they're like, "Okay, thanks. You're great job." And then, yeah, I'm like, "Well, what can I do?" And they're like, "Well, you can go sit in your chair, the one with your name on it, and just." Don't get in the way. Make sure that the performance is working. Well, when the performers are performing, that's fine. But in the meantime, like you're just like waiting. So I was like, oh, can I make it? Can I do something while we're waiting? Like, yeah, we should those kitty key shots that are never going to be in the movie. <laughs> that's they're in the movie. Oh yeah. Question over here. Hey, Mr. Spooner. Uh, quick question. So, big fan of Chips the dog. Uh, yeah. So I, will, I appreciate you not killing him off on camera. That's a, that's a great one. Thank you. I don't think Chips is, I think Chips is still alive. He definitely <laughs> is on that island, because, like, we, we've established that the zombies don't like him. That's he's become question. feral. He's eating the rabbits. He's 100% fine. <laughs> so, so, let me ask, what, what was the thought process? The, chip, the sequel to this movie is just Chips, by the way. <laughs> but, they sent me the script, James Gunn wrote it. It was great. But it was just Chips, and I was like, I don't know. Isn't he running the whole thing? Yeah, yeah it's changing. That's why I said no one. <laughs> uh, so, what was, well, no, uh, so what was the thought process of having the uh, infected not go after the ships? Because, you know, most like... Well, it solved a huge plot problem. Um, <laughs> 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 it okay, all right, sorry. The biology of dogs, you see. <laughs> is, uh, is, also, the one thing that you should know is that Debbie's dog, childhood dog growing up, was named Chips, and that's how the dog got its name. Really? I was like, we should call the dog Chips, because Debbie's dog's childhood dog was named Chips. Yeah. But you must have been eating chips on set. No. No. Yeah, I was like, I'm putting things in the movie that you know. Do zombies eat dogs in real life? No, they don't. Okay. That was the one thing I did that was realistic. Good, because yeah. you kept it close to reality. Thank you. Oh, that's a good point. A good point. Good idea would not have that. Thank God we don't have a commercial. No, yeah. Are you kidding? It's not a commercial movie. No, the, you never kill the dog. Kill everyone, but don't kill the dog. That's a well known Everybody does that. That's a well known fact. Chips is like Chips is like evolved. He's probably built a spaceship by now. <laughs> <laughs> He's ruling some other world. Um, hi, Zach, uh, over here. Um, <laughs> I have a maybe controversial question. Oh, um, <laughs> I, oh no, no, no. <laughs> um, but no, when uh, my former advisor was here, I think he had been around when you were here, and he, I think, said that you, Michael Bay, and Tarsem were here all at the same time. Or At a time, that's true. Yeah, and I think Larry shot for both you and Michael. I'm just kind of curious true. about how you Well, me and Tarsem, but not Michael. Oh, okay, but maybe just overlapping initially in commercials or in school or in the biz now. Like, I'm just kind of curious, like, like, oh my god, that guy from my film studies class, or I don't know, like, if you had any funny stories. No, 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 they're all like, look, Michael, so Michael was, I think, two years ahead of me and Tarsen and Larry, so he was, uh, like, when we were just maybe even three years ahead, because I remember when he was shooting his Coca Cola spot, I don't know if that's. That must be in the archives. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever watched that? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so we shot this Coca Cola spot in like Long Beach with like thousands of extras. It was like 1945, and like the soldiers have just returned from war. And like the guy comes off the boat and he like kisses his girlfriend, kind of in the same iconic. I did that in Watchmen, only with two girls. But um, so he kisses his girlfriend and they drink a Coke, and it's like. It, it, was, oh, Harvard, right? <laughs> it was it was literally like the biggest thing. I might just shut up. But it was like this gigantic commercial. It was so we were all just like, "This who is this guy? This is insane!" Like he has like Panavision cameras and cranes and stuff. This is awesome. And you know, the, and I think that Michael he did an avion water commercial that was amazing. He did like. I don't think what the other ones were, but they were all like epic. And we were just like, I think the thing that was cool about it was we just arrived at school and we were like, oh, okay, this is what I guess everyone's expecting. 
Um, you know, some a thousand extras and like a battleship. So we should get we should get to it. But um, yeah, so but there but I've seen Michael a bunch and he's he's super sweet and it's cool to see him and be like, Oh Zach, how are you doing? Remember when we did that thing or whatever? You worked on my crew. <laughs> <laughs> and Tarsima, of course, is a really good friend. And Larry, you know, I see him. Yeah, talk to him on the phone. So, yeah, these guys are all my, like, buddies. So it's, it, 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 it's, look, I always also say, like, if you're in film school, those people that you're with, you know, your friends who are, like, your crew members or whatever, those are your, those people you'll take with you for the rest of your life. And those will be your, those will be your guys. Oh, that guy's my producer. Like, is Kendall, are you still here? Is Kendall here? So Kendall Henry, um, you know, went to school here. He was my commercial producer for like 10 years. And he runs, he has a Sky Rentals. So like, yeah. And he was just, we were all just sitting around in this room looking at our stupid Super 8 movies. I remember we used to put the Super 8 projector. We had to put it on like a board, right? Because it didn't have enough throw to reach from back there. So we put a board across the uh, seat and then put the projector like that there. You know, basically a sheet up here that we were <laughs> projecting it on. So yeah, that was cool. And like Matthew Ralston. Cool. It's a good group. There's a good group of people. I see him over here. Matthew teaches here, by the way. Matthew Ralston. What's that? Matthew teaches here now. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Power of pleasure. Yeah, he's Power of pleasure. The one of our pleasure is all about. I'm taking that close. It's <laughs> white good. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, hi, Zach. Uh, so Sorry, I'm getting over that. It's uh, so like in the past five years or so, I feel like video games have really come to a level where they are equal, if not surpassing, wow. the emotional context of films. Um, and I was wondering if, like, obviously in 2004, you didn't really draw too much, but. Um, now, are there? Do you look at video games for inspiration for emotion in your films? Um, I don't I, look. I do like video. Um, not gonna lie. Um, and I don't know what that lie we got. <laughs> but uh, I don't think I. I'll be honest. I do not like. I do not use it for my to find that particular. Um, Part of it. Although I do feel like, for me, some of the shot making, some of the shot making, and some of the kind of the way the stories are told visually, I think is can be incredibly innovative and really, really. There's a way in that's different from movies, you know, and I think that that's interesting. Yeah, I was gonna say like for example, one continuous shot, which was just ideas like that. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, yeah. yeah. Doesn't carry over. Yeah, it's hard to. Although I do think what what there's this movie coming out. Um, what's that movie called? It's like this got that forty five minute shot in it. Oh, the Japanese one. Yeah, one shot of the day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah long day's journey. Yeah, long day's journey. That's the one. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I haven't seen it, I see. but I've heard it's pretty awesome. So we'll see. Thanks. When's it coming out? Does you know when it comes out? April 12th. Right. So he has no idea. He doesn't like it. He's not interested in it in any way. Yeah, he might have directed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay. April 12th, we'll have to check it out and we'll be back here. And we'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll see y'all. Yeah. Alright, go ahead. No, no, I just wanted to stand up. Uh, it's cool. Big fan of your guys' work and you as well. Um, um, my name is Chris Cordova. I'm a 30 year old writer, director, editor. Um, I've had a pretty awesome career as far as getting myself out there and uh, getting some really cool work under my belt. I worked with Wiz Khalifa, uh, Blizzard, uh, Toyota, like some really cool companies. It's a lot easier to get out there and do um, work for higher commercial work. Um, I think mean, editor is kind of what I make my bread and butter. But my, my main goal and my main dream is always to write films and to get there. So I know you guys are like, you know, you said, you know, built a good reel, but. What's that next step? You know, like how do you get representation? Do you make a short film? Do I? Are you? I, I'm writing. A film? Are you a writer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, I, and I, that took me through like a four-year course of like learning story structure and plot points and like. So I'm, trying yeah, to, yeah. I'm trying to do it all right. And I'm trying to figure it's it like, out, but 
it's like it's easier to make a living no, no. working, but how do you become the artist? I totally get it. Get some attention from studio execs and people to want to invest in your project. Well, that's a good, Dylan, what do you think? I mean, I it's hard for me because, like, you know, my road was weird. I think you're, you're, how do you, like, when you well, are a director? I, what, I, what I liked what you said tonight was I do think it's about shooting things that you can show, showcase as your thing and uh, do it a lot because there was, there was something about Zach with all of the hours of film that he had shot that was, um, there was a confidence in that. And I think a lot of this, because it is a, it isn't, the, you know, the hard part about film, even though everybody in this room, including me, loves the artistic endeavor of it, it's a business. And the people that fund it are looking to make money. And so they are, yes, and they don't want to just hand it over to Zach and Larry Fong and Michael Bay, like, hey, guys, go. It's a great idea, though. It's a great idea. So, you know, you, having countless hours behind the camera is a good thing. Commercials great thing. Um, representation helps. Having somebody that can speak for you that has, you know, some, is in the game in some way. Um, I'll hand it back over to you. How do you get an agent? If you go to, like, do you see, like, if, you're, if there was like, a young filmmaker at, like, a film festival or something, you, you often see, by the way, I feel like that, I feel like the indie world right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, like, you see so many guys right now who have made like one movie that like was kind of a darling at one of the film festivals. Now they're doing like a Godzilla movie. You know, that seems like where they fuck people. I, I also think right now, and you'll hear this coming out of school, but content is it is king beyond them. Yeah, people want you know Netflix. You know they want eighty movies a year. Well, there's not eighty Zacks. So where's you know where do you find eighty directors? You know what I mean? So that, that's a huge opportunity. I think we could do it. You couldn't do it. Either. I could barely do one. <laughs> so I, I think you should try to use your stuff to get to Zach, and Zach helps you get signed to CIA. There you go. Yeah. Oh, and I just want to do this too. It's an excellent idea. Top left is still here. No, top left. He was afraid. Yeah, get this. Get My agent was here. Yeah, he was. So yeah. I would have just gone like this. My agent from high school. school. So we're sitting right next to you, I think. I we got time for two more questions, guys. Then we're going to wrap it up. I see a hand going up over here. Make them good. So, um, your 2004 Dawn of the Dead is a remake of George A. Romero's 1968 version of Dawn of the Dead. And uh, whenever you do a remake, there's that balance between uh, I'm doing an homage to the original, but I also want to put my own spin on it. So, for you, when you were doing that, how did you sort of find that balance between, oh, I'm, I'm redoing this story people have seen? But I also want to do my own. It's a really great question. <laughs> it is, by the way. It's good to see you. Um, uh, uh, look, first of all, we had James's script, right? So when I read the script, I was like, okay, this is cool. This is the guy who gets it. He, he loves the genre. He, he has respect for the genre. And he has respect for the original film. Like, we try, and, and so. Even though our story in the end is a different story than the original, you know, it has the story elements of the original, and I think that's kind of how we went at it. And then we tried to like homage the original with all the original cast, bringing, well, not all of them, but a lot of the original cast, bringing them back and putting them in those sort of fun cameos. Kind of say, like, we get it, we understand, we respect. So, therefore, hopefully, we're going to take you on this other ride. But, no, but we know where we came from. We know our roots, and we want to make sure that you understand that we understand. I think that's kind of how we went at it. And I, I think, you know, so, you know, and like all the things, like the helicopter, Galen Ross, like all the things that we tried to do you know, throughout the film to kind of just make sure that everyone understood that that we were, you know, paying homage more than we were remaking that. that. And by the way, I, I would want to try and remake that movie exactly because it, it's awesome. So, like, why, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's a, it is a slippery slope. 
And look, in the end, it's an IP that people know, like Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, make Dawn of the Dead again. That sounds great. It's an awesome name for a movie. <laughs> it's an alliteration. You can't, those are so hard to forget. Yeah? And so if you have one, like, yeah, you should definitely do it. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, I hope that answers the question. Here we go. Hi, uh, Zach. Um, question is, you referenced SWAT earlier on. I'm curious beyond that, too, about your early days of working on uh, What were some projects that you were working on that you were really going towards? How was the pitching process like early on? As you know, how did you navigate working with I, For me, what I would do is I did have a shtick that I thought worked, and clearly it probably didn't, no, in, in hindsight. Um, I thought it was clever. Uh, what I would do is, <laughs> uh, idiot, uh, I would uh, say to the studio executive, the young studio executive, because it was always a super young studio executive who was, who was meeting me, because they were like, oh, there's this commercial director who wants to make a movie, You're, you go meet him. Like, that, that's how that was. I didn't know that at the Thanks. time. I thought I had like my finger on the pulse of the studio. But clearly, now I know I did not remember. Not a good executive. No, you. Yeah, I was. I know, but I actually had a pro no. I had a project with you. That was oh. that's different. I'm talking about like my first meetings when I was uh, when I was doing generals. I was getting insecure. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I was when I was literally doing generals. So I would say they would. So so you're in a meeting with like you go to a general at a studio. So they're like, first of all, you have to get that meeting. So they're like, okay, maybe they're doing a favor for your agent. I don't know what, but anyway, so you show. You show up, and, and the first thing is like, so, you know, what are you interested in? What kind of movies do you want to make? Well, how do you see yourself? What kind of films? What kind of a voice do you have? Like, or anything. So I would always say, hey, that's all cool, but what do you guys, like, have here at the studio that, that you don't know how to, like, make into a movie? Or that, like, you know, what's a library property or a piece of IP you guys love that you can't figure out? That's what I would say. That's a good. That's a good thing to do, right? Because yeah. all studios are sitting on a bunch of IP that they've tried and they haven't figured it out, and you may be the one that. Has. And by the way, SWAT was that for me, and they said, "Well, we have this thing. I don't know if you're interested in things like SWAT." I'm like, "SWAT, I love fucking SWAT. It's awesome. My favorite show. I just watch every episode." And they were like, "What, really?" And I was like, "Yeah, I, I have a great. I, if I could do SWAT, I would just like it would be bad. It'd be awesome." And, it, and so that actually got me another meeting. I got a second meeting. Because they were like, hey, you, do you want to come and say that to another guy? And I was like, yeah, I'll say that to you. I'll say that for a week. So like, you keep bringing people for me to say that to, I'll say it. Um, so that kind of worked. I, I also was up, we also, I worked on Mage. I worked on um, before, no, Mage after. Before. Anyway, Mage, um, Dead World, there was another comic book. Called Dead World. Um, what else was out there? Three Hundred. We actually were pitch. We pitched Three Hundred before I did Dawn. No one wanted to do Three Hundred, so they were like Three Hundred. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, and I'd be like, okay, well, I have this thing Three Hundred. I would say that too. Like, it's like it's a comic book, Frank Miller. You know, like he's awesome. Like, okay, no. None of that. So I'd say, okay, well, what do you guys have? That's cool. And then I would. Try and work that. But yeah, they had they had one hundred at the time. No, because that's what happened with um with Warner Brothers. I said we had this thing three hundred. They're like, what what is that again? And I'm like, what's oh, this like three guys and you know three hundred like, million versus like crazy you know underdog story. And they're like, oh, so it's a Greek Greek thing. I'm like, yeah, it's Greek. It's like sword and sandals. I'm like, sword and yeah, I guess that's a genre. Yes. And they'd say, well, we have, we're doing a thing right now called Troy. And I'm like, okay, Troy's awesome. And they're like, yeah, we have a guy, Brad Pitt. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I'm like, yeah, Brad Pitt's awesome. And they're like, well, and you don't have him. You just, that's, all you have is this, whatever, because it's my, I'm pointing at the comic book, by the way. Like, and I'd say, yeah, that, but look how awesome this is. And they're like, yeah, no, that's not it. So then it went on to a shelf. So where did buy them? He tried to buy it. See, he knows. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I'll add is um, studio executives and producers want their directors to have a strong point of view. So if you have a handle on them, it's 
necessarily express yourself with words or with actions. Um, Damn words again with strong play here. That, that's what matters. That's a great way that's to wrap good. this up. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you again. Everybody, thank you so much. Everybody stay. It's so kind. Through the rantings of the madman, at least there was two rational people up here with me. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks. Thanks. We'll see a bunch of you tomorrow. Thanks again. Thanks again. Thank you again.